Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second edition of the European Conference on Architecture in the Media. It has been conceived as a place to meet and to change experiences on the dissemination of architecture. It is addressed to journalists, cultural institutions and organizations, communication professionals, architects and architecture lovers. Architecture and the media is focused on architecture perceived as culture and dissemination of both core values and most cutting edge topics through the media, either news and specialized media, print, broadcast and online media. Architecture and the media is organized by the Fundación Mies van der Rohe and Lavo with the support of Creative Europe and the Barcelona City Council. As part of the dissemination program of the European Union Prize for Contemporary Architecture, Mies van der Rohe Award. It takes place during the Barcelona Architecture Week that this year held a special online edition from 7 to 17th May with more than 150 proposals open to everyone. This year's edition is curated by Miriam Giordano, expert in communication, director of Labo, and longtime partner of Fundación Mies van der Rohe. What makes architecture alluring for the media? Why is it such a challenge for architecture to gain visibility in the cultural section of news media? What presence does it have in other sections, such as politics or economics? How significant is the role of the media in making architecture understood and appreciated by broader audiences? What makes a case of success in the collaboration between institutions and the media in the diffusion of architecture? And this second edition of Architecture and the Media, together with general topics, will focus on television, radio and audiovisual media and will deepen the cross-cutting subject of architectural images. In these times when we are experiencing an extraordinary situation that limits travel and the possibility of holding events together, we still want to keep alive the debate on dissemination of architecture. For this reason, this year, the venue of the event moves from the inspiring Mies van der Rohe Pavilion in Barcelona, where I am happy to be, to the YouTube channel of Fundación Mies van der Rohe, where you are more than welcome. I want to thank all the staff at Fundación Mies van der Rohe for the enormous effort they have made to make this possible, as well as our friends from Labo. I also want to deeply thank our guests that agreed to share with us their knowledge and opinions in a very short time lapse uh, to prepare. I am really looking forward listening to all of them. And last but not least, I want to thank all our media partners that are keeping our efforts to disseminate architecture and culture throughout Europe day to day, year after year. So thank you everyone for being with us and for supporting us. I will now give the word to Hugues Becard on behalf of the European Commission. So thank you and enjoy. Thank you, Anna. Uh, well, it's a pleasure for me to, to, to be here in such a, a great company to open the second uh, European Conference on Architecture and, uh, and, and the Media. Uh, it takes place uh, online for obvious uh, reasons uh, this year. So uh, congratulations to, to the whole team, Labo, Miriam, and, and the Foundation for making it uh, possible. And thank you indeed uh, to the speakers for accepting to, uh, to, to be on board. Actually, maybe the, the, uh, the only advantage of this uh, uh, lockdown and uh, virtual uh, edition is that it, it would be actually uh, 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 accessible to, to a wider wider audience. This is maybe 
maybe something we can uh, we, we can reflect on uh, during uh, during this, uh, the, the, this conference. Because actually, as you said, Anna, the, the aim of the, 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 the conference is actually to explore how we can better communicate uh, architecture and reach out to, uh, to citizens, I mean, not only, uh, not only experts. And uh, even if uh, on the one side, of course, there's a scientific and uh, intellectual discourse on architecture, which has its own merits and which is uh, obviously uh, needed. But uh, on the other hand, I, I, I believe there's a need actually for a more accessible and maybe less conceptual discourse uh, so that uh, in a way every citizen can feel concerned because uh, in the end, uh, architecture is uh, affecting everybody's life and especially nowadays actually. That may be another uh, actually uh, uh, reflection path because in a way people have rediscovered their homes, have had to re rediscover their homes, their qualities, but also maybe their limitations. And still for many people, I mean, there, there, there are still a lot of uh, uh, limitations. So that in a way, it may be a good time actually to, to discuss architecture. I mean, it's, uh, it's, its values and its impact on people's lives. Uh, so that's why it's important also to, uh, to communicate uh, uh, better and to do so uh, to, to, work, uh, to work with media. So for all these reasons, actually, Creative Europe is, uh, is very happy to support this event for, for, for the second time. This is, of course, uh, part of our longstanding cooperation with the EU MIS Award, as, uh, as uh, you've mentioned. But it's also in line with actually one of the priorities of the Creative Europe program, which is about uh, uh, audience development, audience engagement. And I think this is very much needed in the field of, uh, of, of architecture. Uh, we are also working with the member states on this. I mean, we have actually now an expert group, uh, so dealing with uh, what we call high quality architecture and built environment for everyone. But actually in the title of the, I mean, the, the title, which is a bit formal, you, you can hear for everyone. So there again, you have this uh, sense of uh, 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 sharing and uh, of uh, ownership uh, that is uh, needed among uh, European uh, citizens. So this group will work on policy recommendations and one, one of the fields should be about uh, actually uh, reaching out to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to citizens and involving citizens also in, uh, in, uh, in architecture. Um, so I'm very uh, happy to, to be able to uh, launch in a way uh, together with uh, Anna this, uh, this event. I think it can be a very stimulating uh, experience and I wish you uh, a very uh, good conference with uh, stimulating debates. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anna and Hughes. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to introduce the program of Architecture in the Media 2020. In 2018, the first edition saw the participation of distinguished journalists from the print news media, technical magazines, and online platforms. It was a revelatory experience, not so much of answers as of many questions and critical reflections that together with new questions, today give lives to this new edition. If there is an element that distinguishes the diffusion of architecture today, it is the plurality of means and sources of information. To reflect this plurality, this year we wanted to dedicate space uh, to broadcast media, TV, radio, and audiovisual, and go a bit deeper into the cross-cutting subject of architectural image copyright. This year, the event is online, a new formula that while has deprived us of the pleasure of meeting all in person in the wonderful Miss van der Rohe Pavilion in Barcelona, where Anna was now, it allows everybody around the world to enjoy the event from home and permit it to the organization to hoard speakers otherwise unreachable for their work commitment, such as the Guardian's architecture and design critic, Oliver Wainwright, who is here with us this afternoon and will protagonize our opening conversation, the role of the sources in the generation of the topics for architecture journalism. Tomorrow and Wednesday, at the same time, 5 p.m., the program continues with the round tables. Two debates dedicated to television, thematic channels, and online video platforms on the 12th. Channels and new trends on the 13th. In the morning of the 14th, last day of this online edition, we will hold a workshop by lawyer Rick and Rick under the name Copyright in Architectural Images. And for the closing conversation on the evening of the 14th, 
the role of images in telling the story of an architectural work will be our conversation. There we will meet the photographer Ivan Ban, who has challenged a long-standing tradition of depicting building as isolated and static, introducing individuals as the element that give meaning and context to the architectural and space that surround us. I leave you now with a video presentation of Oliver Wainwright, architect and the Guardian's architecture and design critic. At the end, the dialogue with Stefan Genciulescu, architect, editor-in-chief and director of the architectural magazine Zeppelin will start. We invite you to put both of them, all your questions through the live chat. Enjoy the debate. Uh, my name is Oliver Wainwright and I'm the architecture and design critic of The Guardian based in London. Yeah, so it was never my plan to become a journalist, if I'm honest. I always thought I would be an architect, so I, I went to university to study architecture. Um, my dissertation uh, in my undergraduate was about uh, the urban development of Beijing in the run-up to the Olympics. So I guess my interests suddenly kind of moved towards the urban scale and the kind of political forces that drive urban development. So not so much looking at you know buildings specifically, but the kind of often invisible network of drivers that end up shaping architecture and the built environment. So after university, I went to work for the mayor of London, who back then had a team called the Architecture and Urbanism Unit, um, whose job was to do that kind of macro strategic planning. And interestingly enough, it was in the run up to the London Olympics. So some of what I'd witnessed, you know, by examining Beijing um, became very useful. And I suppose it opened my, my eyes to the, the mechanics of city making, you know, how decisions are made often behind closed doors the way that the development industry operates. Um, at the time, East London, which is where the Olympics was going to be held, was seeing an enormous influx of speculative development. So, so you know, building was happening at a very fast pace without so much planning is, is the sense that I got. So I suppose I was keen to, to find a way to explain those processes to the public, to a wider audience. I think people often don't really understand how buildings and, and pieces of city come to be. So I started writing freelance um, for magazines like Icon, uh, The Architect's Journal, occasionally Domus. Um, then I moved to Rotterdam to work for OMA and AMO, which I would say didn't really have architecture, but it was a very interesting kind of journalistic experience to see how an office of that scale operates. And particularly to see how a journalist like Rem Koolhaas can kind of conduct an architecture practice and how he operated almost like an in-house critic kind of curating other people's ideas and bringing ideas together to form projects so it was kind of fascinating to to almost be a fly on the wall but also embedded in that process um, then i came back to london to do my masters at the royal college of art um, and, and focused again my attentions on the london olympic legacy plan and kind of critiquing the processes that were underway, this kind of steamroller of urban development that was going to, you know, completely transform an entire swathe of East London and proposing a kind of alternative community-led plan for the Olympic legacy. So I suppose my, my work, you know, even though I was doing an architecture course where you were kind of forced to design a building, ultimately, I was always much more interested in those bigger political, social, environmental forces that, that shape um, architecture. And that's what you know, I was, I was trying to write as much as possible. I even asked if I could do my final project in the form of a, an essay rather than a, a design for a building, but that wasn't allowed, sadly. Um, and then when I graduated from the RCA, I was offered a job at Building Design Magazine, which is like a weekly newspaper for architects. So um, I was there for two years as the kind of in-house critic, I suppose, doing a weekly review, um, quite an in-depth building study of a major project every week. So I guess that's what gave me the kind of training, you know, being able to, to write in, in depth and, and quite kind of technically about buildings for a professional audience. 
Um, and then I suppose a, a dramatic shift came in, in 2012 when The Guardian advertised for a new architecture critic. Um, the, the guy, Jonathan Glancy, who had been the critic before, had been doing the job for maybe 20 years or more. And they suddenly wanted a kind of new, younger, um, web-facing critic. So it'd be a completely different role. It'd be much more responsive and rapid. Um, initially writing something every day for the website, kind of responding to an issue that was on in the day's news or that something that just happened. So I had to kind of recalibrate the way I uh, wrote and thought about architecture from writing quite technical building studies for a professional audience to suddenly working out how to make architecture interesting for the general public and, and kind of explaining the, the often invisible forces that um, shape the built environment. Um, there's not really a regular column, so there, there used to be, when, when the paper was very much focused on the print edition, there was a kind of weekly column where the architecture critic would write their, you know, opinion or review of a project that week. Since international media has moved so much online, you know, we have to be much more responsive, so there isn't a set weekly slot. Um, sometimes I end up writing five articles a week, sometimes it's one. It totally depends on kind of what's happening and what the the demand is from the the kind of uh, web side of things. So I'm kind of officially contracted to write 2,500 words every week, and that can be a series of much shorter articles or you know one or two uh, much longer in depth articles. And it's changed over time. When I started the job in 2012, there was a, a kind of urge to have as much content on the website as possible. So I was initially asked to write one article every day, you know, kind of rapid fire blog posts. And I, I found that increasingly frustrating and kind of made the argument to my editor that people don't come to The Guardian to read a kind of rapid fire blog. They, they come to The Guardian for hopefully a bit more considered uh, long form opinion, you know, that's had some real research behind it. So I've now been there for about uh, eight years, I guess, and, and over that, that period of time, I've progressively argued to do fewer but longer pieces, which is what I always wanted to do, you know, slightly more kind of rigorous and uh, in-depth features. And in terms of the, um, the style of, you know, is there a style of projects that they um, prefer? I, I have a fairly open brief. Um, I, I'm never really asked to write about a particular project. They kind of trust me to come up with the themes and topics for articles and proposed buildings and um, issues that I should be writing about. So that's uh, I'm in a very lucky position in that sense to have that kind of open brief. Uh, for The Guardian, it's only me. So the, the Guardian has a sister paper called The Observer, which comes out on a Sunday. And confusingly on the website, they both appear as The Guardian. So there's an Observer architecture critic, Rowan Moore, who's very established and has been writing for much longer than me. He, he's the architecture critic of The Observer. Um, but on, on the internet, they both appear as The Guardian. So yeah, I'm, I'm the only, uh, I guess, architecture critic or correspondent for The Guardian. It's interesting. I think the articles that are the most popular are the ones that kind of expose the mechanics of urban development. So I wrote quite a few, um, you know, long, almost investigative pieces about the property industry and system and how certain loopholes allow developers to, to get away without building the required affordable housing. Um, so it's issues like that, which have a lot of kind of popular appeal that maybe pull back the curtains from what's often quite a kind of secretive or obscure process. Um, and I suppose it's very difficult to measure the impact of any articles, but there were a series that I did on, on something called financial viability, which is, again is a loophole in the planning system, which means developers can argue that the required amount of affordable housing isn't financially viable. So it was a series of pieces looking into examples of how that loophole was being exploited. And I think that did have an impact, you know, it gave a number of community groups, the kind of ammunition they needed to fight back against these kinds of developments. And uh, you know, I wasn't the only one writing about this, but there was a kind of movement to expose this practice. And that did actually end up having a change 
um, there was a, a change to the planning policy, kind of planning system regulation. So, so that's been slightly reformed. Um, I'd say another example was the Garden Bridge, Thomas Heatherwick's famous proposal to build a, a, um, a, a bridge covered in trees across the Thames. And I wrote about 12 articles kind of against that project. And again, there, you know, there are many other journalists fighting against it as well, but eventually that, that project did get cancelled. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's projects, you know, issues that have that kind of popular um, interest and, and articles that explain to people the, the kind of often invisible forces that are shaping the city. Those are the ones that seem to be the most popular. Yeah, it's interesting. I think topics that are very popular in the architecture world are often the ones that the public find the least interesting. <laughs> so, um, you know, architecture biennales and triennales, you know, which I often have to review, they get very little traffic on the website. Uh, you know, they're things that the architecture community is obsessed with, but things that the general public really don't care less about. Um, it can also be disappointing when, when you find a, a, an architect that you want to kind of um, present to, to a wider audience, maybe an obscure practice from overseas, and you want to kind of explain why this style of work is so interesting and, and you know, the kinds of projects these maybe younger, less well-known practices are doing. Again, it can be difficult to, um, to, to kind of drive traffic on those articles. Um, an example I, I wrote about two museums in Switzerland by Christen and Gantenbein, the Kunstmuseum in Basel and the Landesmuseum in Zurich, you know, both of which I thought were incredibly interesting. And uh, they didn't, didn't get many page views on The Guardian at all. So it's, it's a tricky balance, you know, trying to write the, the articles that will be popular, but also arguing for space for, for the more niche topics, you know, because counting the number of page views shouldn't be the only reason that we we write about certain topics so i do often try and make the case that that you know it's it's valid and useful to be writing about certain uh, architects and projects even if they might not get the most uh, most clicks of any article I'd say the challenge for architecture critics is that we're often placed within the cultural section of the newspaper. You know, we appear in the arts pages, but so often the things that, that I feel we should be writing about don't fit in the kind of culture silo. You know, it's the nature of public space, it's social housing, it's the quality of our streets and infrastructure and stations and, you know, much bigger um, aspects of the urban environment, which I am pitched to a, an arts editor they might not really kind of understand the significance. And it's, it's difficult for them as well you know, to put a feature on, say, um, social housing or public space in the arts section of the newspaper. So I think that's the biggest frustration that architecture critics have, that often the topics they want to write about don't kind of count as culture. And yet my argument is that of all of the, the kind of artistic mediums, architecture is the one that affects everyone the most. You know, you, you choose to watch a film, you choose to go out and buy a book or go to an exhibition, but architecture kind of happens to you. You know, everyone lives in a building, goes to work in a building, uses the streets and, and urban spaces. It's the, the medium that has the kind of widest impact on the world, which is why I always think architecture, you know, criticism deserves to be in, in every kind of news media, but so often it's, um, it's siloed into the art section to its detriment, I think. So I'm, I'm lucky in a sense that The Guardian has allowed me to write for other sections. So for a long time, we had a cities website where I got space to go and, and do quite kind of in-depth features on, on particular um, urban phenomena around the world. So I wasn't only writing about art galleries and opera houses, which is often the, uh, the face of a lot of architecture critics in, in the art sections. Hello. Hello, everybody. I am, uh, hello, Oliver. Hi, Stefan. Good to see you. Uh, I'm quite excited to be here, and it's an honor for me. 
And uh, well, uh, uh, what we're going to do is that I'm going to put you about five, six questions, and then uh, we will let the audience in. So people are going to write on uh, YouTube and on Facebook and so on. And I will try to get as much uh, as much uh, questions as possible. Okay. I know how boring it is when you you're talking about a round table or something like that, and uh, <laughs> only a couple of people are talking. So we we'll try to get it. And uh, I will start with a question. Uh, well, the title of uh, the, the, the conference is about, uh, and uh, about our meeting today is about sources of information. And uh, I would like to ask you very shortly, what are your main sources for information? Uh, are, you, uh, are you traveling? Are you, uh, uh, are, you are you looking on the big sites? That's a guilty pleasure or not? Uh, big architecture sites or... Uh, do you follow the architectural prizes? Uh, do you, uh, are people sending you projects? The architects, uh, do you have a lot of PR mail and institutional mail? I would, I would really, really like to know about, uh, about this. Well, that's a great question. And I have to say, it's actually one that I've never been asked before in all of the interviews I've done about the role of the architecture critic and uh, the state of contemporary criticism. No one's ever said, where, where do you get your stories from? So it, it made me think. Um, and it's, it's a whole variety of, of different sources is the answer. So, I mean, I receive, you know, probably a couple of thousand press releases every week, most of which I don't even open. So I have to say um, the majority of the, the stories don't come from press releases or PR agencies. And I always like to think of, I think it was George Orwell who once said, journalism is printing what someone else does not want, does not want to be printed. Everything else is just PR. And I don't you know, entirely agree with that. I think obviously you know, there's space for positive uh, architectural comment, but, but I tend not to follow um, what the PR companies uh, want me to write about. So I say that the main sources come from things like uh, you know, government announcements, new policies, if there's a new kind of planning policy or a change in legislation that has much bigger uh, kind of spatial or political impacts on, on the built environment. I often write about um, things like that. Uh, reports that come out from think tanks and NGOs like the, the Royal Town Planning Institute often produces very good and kind of thorough reports on the ways that local authorities are, are building housing again for the first time in, in decades. Um, planning applications, to say, uh, I spend a lot of time looking through the planning portal to kind of see what's happening um, that might not necessarily have made the headlines elsewhere. And I think it's important as a critic to, to sometimes write about things before they've happened, given that we can actually have an influence on, on how our cities are being shaped. So I, I do spend quite a lot of time writing about proposals um, before they get anywhere near breaking ground. Um, I'd say another source is often community groups. Um, I mean, London and, and the rest of the UK has very active kind of community campaign groups and I, I get a huge number of emails from kind of concerned residents who are trying to kind of raise um, issues over the nature of proposed developments in, in their neighbourhoods. So I do, I often rely on um, on campaigners who've, you know, spent many weekends and evenings kind of digging into the murkier sides of the way that developers operate to uh, to provide me with, with some sources occasionally. Um, other sources for articles, I guess, come from books. Um, that's one kind of symptom of the lockdown I finally have more time to read so uh, I've been doing a few more book reviews than I usually would. Um, exhibitions are often a very good source for, for kind of finding topics to then write much more broadly around a subject um, and, and often you just kind of happen upon things by mistake but one of the most popular articles I wrote recently was about a gigantic guitar shaped hotel in Florida which um, hadn't really made the architectural press because it wasn't by a famous architect. It was kind of in the middle of nowhere near Fort Lauderdale. Um, but I was in Miami a couple of years ago and just drove past it on the highway. And, and you know, that's how that building came to my attention. And then I looked into it and realized it had actually been developed by the Seminole Native American tribe and had a kind of fascinating story behind it. So sometimes you just kind of happen upon things when you're not looking for them. Yeah, that's... Uh... It was wait, waiting for uh, Venturi and uh, you came along. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's the ultimate duck building. Um, you, are talking, yeah, you are talking in your interview a little bit about going from writing for a very specialized audience, the architects, 
writing for a more general cultivated audience at The Guardian. And uh, what I would like to ask you is how do you write very briefly, how do you write uh, differently? And is it the same discourse which is adapted or is it a completely different uh, uh, target from the start and you and you put yourself in the mind when you write for The Guardian? I mean, there, there will be architects who, who will be reading you, no? How, how, do you, how do you balance this? Or how, yeah, how, how different very, should they be, I, uh, do you think? I, I had to completely kind of recalibrate the way that I approach criticism. Because I mean, with, with Building Design magazine, um, I, was, I had the luxury of an interested audience. You know, I was guaranteed that anyone reading BD has an interest in architecture. With The Guardian, which now has a global audience of about 360 million people, you know, I, I don't have any reason to believe that any of them are interested in architecture. So you have to kind of um, you, be very conscious of explaining why the story is important, um, which I think is a, a really good challenge also for architects and, and kind of PR companies to think about, you know, what, what impact does this have on, on Joe Public, on the man in the street? You know, why should we be talking about architecture? And then I suppose the other thing is in terms of structuring a story, I was much more used to doing a kind of conventional building study where you talk in very architectural terms about the nature of a building, you know, whether it's the composition of the facade or the materials used or the qualities of daylight and how you navigate through the building. Writing for a national newspaper, you have to have much more of a story to, to engage the reader. So whether that's about the, the developer behind the project or, um, you know, the particular kind of function of that building or the nature of the site or the community that it's going to affect, there has to be a, a bigger um, kind of social or political or economic or environmental story than just the architectural kind of fact of the building alone. Um, so it, is, it can be a, a great challenge, especially when I'm writing about some slightly more um, niche or kind of esoteric projects to, to make it compelling and engaging to a general audience. But uh, uh, your conscience, I guess, that uh, especially on, in your international audience, there are lots of architects, actually, and that maybe your international public and the British public will be very, or English speaking public will be very different. Yeah. No, so it's, still it's, try to get to architects in a way. Yeah, I mean, I do, I'm conscious that I'm also writing for an architectural audience, but I suppose I'm, I'm constantly under pressure from my editors to make sure that the subject also has a wider appeal. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting, you know, language, for example, very early on when I joined The Guardian, I, I wrote the phrase, um, a colonnade of steel columns, and it got changed by a sub-editor into a row of shiny metal poles. And I was furious, you know, I was like, how dare you change this? <laughs> and, and I suppose I've, I've got less precious as the time has gone on. And, and also I think I'm, I'm winning the argument now that actually it's useful to include technical um, language yeah. occasionally or else people won't broaden their vocabulary. Of but course. It, it's a difficult balance to, to strike between, you know, accessibility and then also kind of pushing the, the discourse in the profession. I was I was wondering uh, if you can uh, jump a little bit. You are both architects. Uh, do you think that there are still people today, uh, non-architects, able to talk very well about architecture? I mean, like Ruskin or Victor Hugo did in the 19th century. Is there? A... Yeah, I, can I they think talk better um... than us about architecture. <laughs> It's interesting, actually. Yeah, people say as an architecture critic, you know, are the better critics the ones who have trained as architects or, or not the people that come from outside the profession? And I would say, you know, having trained as an architect, you have a certain level of sympathy, which is, is useful because, you know, how difficult it is to realise anything, you know, let alone a good building. But that can also be dangerous. You can have too much sympathy with your subject. Yeah. And one of my favorite writers uh, on architecture, actually, who sadly doesn't write so much anymore, was Kieran Long, um, who's now the director of ArcDes in Stockholm. And, and he didn't have an architecture background. I think he'd studied literature, and, but, but came at the subject from an outsider's angle. And I think therefore was able to make the kinds of connections and you know, kind of mm -hmm. got a broader discourse to the subject than maybe an architecture specialist. Um, would have done. So yeah, I, th I think there's a whole, you know, a whole range of, uh, of different approaches. Still talking about the bubble, because you also mentioned uh, Biennales and, uh, and all the rest being among ourselves, architects mostly. Uh, how do you see an award, even a very important award, getting to a broader audience? 
how do you see how can it become relevant in in order to bring architecture to the public and also uh, if your communication always goes both ways so if you also don't just want to have pr for people but also have their reactions if how can awards be a, a let's say a, an opportunity for letting us know what people really think about architecture and what people want that's a very good question um, I have to say I'm generally very suspicious of awards and of the whole kind of awards culture, because in my experience, they, they're generally money-making uh, exercises. You know, the, the, the awards run by magazines or private institutions, um, you pay a huge amount of money to enter the award, and then you pay a huge amount of money to attend the dinner where the award is, is awarded. Um, so you're, you're essentially kind of paying for validation. And it's- But I'm not talking about this one. I'm speaking about your words given for by big international, by foundations or by the chambers of architects or like Nice Award and so on. Yeah, I mean, even, even the, the RIBA, you know, the Royal Institute of British Architects, which claims to have the kind of gold standard for awards, you, you pay quite a high fee to enter those awards. And I, um, I, I'm not saying it, it kind of takes away their validity, but, but I find that the kind of independent awards where you, you don't submit, but your, your project is selected, I, I think they're much more kind of compelling. Um, but, but back to your original question, I suppose, how, how can you make them interesting for the public or what impact do they have? They, they have a huge impact when the winner um, is the kind of project that does influence people's everyday lives or is kind of connected to a topic that the public is interested in. So the example I would give you is the, the Sterling Prize. Uh, the most recent winner was Goldsmith Street uh, project in Norwich, which was 100% social housing at a time when very few councils are actually building social housing yeah. at the moment and it showed that it was eminently possible to do that you know so it actually gave ammunition to local authorities who've been pleading for decades to kind of get the funding to do these projects i think it was really helpful in raising the profile and showing that actually it is possible um, you know if you kind of have to operate under the radar but it is there are ways that councils can build housing again Another example was, I think, in 2015, when the Sterling Prize went to a high school, which was, you know, one of the very few times that a, a school building wins an accolade of that. Um, yeah. That and it, it just brings it up the political agenda. It means that other national newspapers that don't have architecture critics writing for them might finally uh, decide to cover architecture as a topic. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite interesting that in recent time, well, I mean, we saw it also with the MISA award that uh, housing and social housing uh, starts to come back as an awardable type of projects, which I think yeah, is... Yeah, and I think the, the, mo the two most recent awards. prizes are, are fascinating examples, because as you know, they're, they're both, you know, renovations of kind of hated post-war blocks and, and done with a, an economy of means and an agility which serves as a model for thousands of similar blocks all over the world. So to, to me, those are two of the most important prizes in terms of sending a message of uh, you know, reuse rather than demolition and how architects can be so useful in those kinds of situations. So it's not absolutely necessary to have star architecture. No, exactly. Yeah, and, 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 comes into the media anyway. I have the, I have this impression that uh, spectacular architecture is uh, always in the media. Yeah, well, I think there's been a move away from from that. I'd say over the last decade, um, you know, af after the kind of age of the icon, which was, I suppose, the the early two thousands or the the noughties, um, I, I think there's been a huge reaction against that. If you look at the nature of the most recent Venice Biennales or even the nature of the Mies van der Rohe Prize, you know, there's a conscious attempt not to award kind of spectacular iconic architecture and, and look towards a more kind of politicized form of practice, which I, I encourage personally. However, I, I mean, I'm, I'm still looking at uh, surveys, uh, starting with the 80s and even now, and there is a constant in surveys when people are asked what their more favor, favorite modern building, modernist building is, and it's the Sydney Opera all the time. So it kind of stretches and goes through centuries. And uh, it's, it's funny because it is a spectacular project. It is iconic, but in the same time, it's very old. And it kind of keeps steps see, with, uh, with itself, which I find. Yeah, really I'm, I'm slightly more optimistic um, that, that the public, it, you know, that there is an increasing awareness of um, slightly more radical architecture. And, and I, I would point to the, the very unlikely revival of brutalism. Um, yeah. 
particularly in the UK and, and I'm sure actually in, in Bucharest as well, you know, it's some of the kind of buildings of a particular era which have been you know, absolutely hated by the previous generation are now being revived and, and loved by a new generation. Or less, by architects. By to the welfare state. You know, it's, it's the longing for that kind of golden age when we did actually have a welfare state and when the government built and schools and hospitals. So I think the kind of aesthetic of brutalism is tied up with that kind of longing for, for that political era as well. Yes, if it's not complicated by extreme political changes like the East, where it's very funny that modernism is equal with a totalitarian regime, but uh, pseudo-classical buildings, which were built by the same regimes, are not, are not uh, equal with them because people like them more. So it's a kind of transfer of a political uh, hate, but it's actually an aesthetic hate with, uh, to, to begin with. Interesting. Uh, I have two, uh, two very short questions, and then I, I, will, I will also start to look at uh, what the audience uh, asks. Uh, one is very short and provocative. Is there still a need for us? Is there still need for criticism when you can find absolutely everything everywhere? And then, of course, I would get to the Corona question and about uh, the job of writing and distributing and communicating in architecture if you are confined and if travels get uh, less. You can even choose only to answer to one of them. No, I'll, I'll try and go for both if we have time. Um, yeah, I, I would a couple say... Of minutes, yeah. I would say absolutely there is a need for architecture criticism now more than ever. Um, if, if you look at the kinds of, of speculative developments that are being thrown up in cities across the world, you know, it, it shows just how much we need critics to be pulling these things apart. And I think the role of the critic has changed. It's no longer um, the person in the ivory tower kind of spouting their opinion. It's our responsibility to actually explain to the public how these development machines operate and, and kind of expose the, the often invisible forces that are driving these kinds of projects. So that's what I spend a lot of my time doing, doing quite kind of long form articles that unpick particular loopholes in the planning system or kind of explain how developers are managing to get away without providing the amount of affordable housing they should. So I, I think you know, now more than ever, we need to become kind of activist critics um, in, in the face yeah. of what's been happening over the last decade. Um, in terms of the corona question, uh, I think I'm, I'm hesitant to speculate too much in, in how the coronavirus is going to change cities. Um, I've been speaking to a lot of kind of historians of pandemics and they say, you know, to be honest, we only change if a pandemic comes back. So, you know, if COVID-19 is with us for the next five or ten years, then yes, I think cities will be forced to change. Um, if it's over you know, in the next couple of years, I fear that we'll probably go back to exactly the way we did before. And, and after the 2008 crisis, when everyone was optimistic, it's about, it's about fear or hope. And it didn't. It's about fear or hope because we see today that even very serious people are writing about how new cities should be uh, about the car because it's safer uh, for not uh, getting infected and how the density is a bad thing and that we should allow sprawl again. So I fear that, uh, I, I fear what you say, but I also hope in a certain way that, uh, that the current uh, crisis is not going to wipe away in the discourse everything else and that you're not getting cured of diabetes to die of cancer yeah. afterwards. So, I mean, I'm optimistic that the biggest impact might be on the streetscape. You know, the fact that we've seen so many temporary bicycle lanes. I think Paris yeah. is building 650 kilometers of bike lanes. Uh, our government has just unveiled a two billion pound plan to improve walking and cycling. So those are the kinds of things that I really hope will last. But I think we'll have to fight for it because in Wuhan, um, after the lockdown, I think the use of private car transport doubled. You know, so these are things that we're really going to have to fight for. They're not going to happen automatically. Okay, I will, um, I, will, uh, I, will, I will directly go to the questions because there are already some very interesting ones. Uh, and there's somebody who asked if communication schools should be uh, should be presented and taught at architecture schools. What do you think about that? If these are skills that should be in the curriculum or not? Yes, for architects? I, would, I would say 100%. <laughs> <laughs> you only have to read um, an architect's statement in a planning application to realize quite what poor communicators most of the architectural profession uh, is, I'm afraid. Um, Although sometimes we are better communicators than architects, but okay, this is 
<laughs> I, I think architects are particularly prone to kind of obfuscation. Um, you know, there's a word archi-speak for a reason yeah. that, that we like to kind of layer complexity upon complexity and avoid clarity at all costs. Um, so I, I'm a huge advocate for, for simplicity and clarity and directness when it comes to communicating architecture. Maybe less philosophical references also. <laughs> exactly. yeah. And uh, well, uh, I think one of the questions is, I think well actually addressed, do you consider that uh, architecture journalism tends to reproduce the social paradigm of architecture, which makes the star system uh, too visible and leaves small studies aside? I think that's our job not to do that, no? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, it can do at its worst. Um, but, but as you say, it's our responsibility not to do that and, and to, as far as we can, kind of highlight the lesser known practices that are working for the public good and, mm -hmm. and driven by kind of social ideals rather than financial <laughs> imperatives. So, um, but, but again, I'm, I'm optimistic generally about the nature and quality of architecture criticism at the moment. I think there is a move away from worshipping the kind of old yeah. guard of, uh, of icon creators, personally. Okay. Uh, th this is one that actually it's for you but it touches me a lot architecture magazines used to be a space for discussion but they're slowly disappearing from store shelves well the question was do you think architectural critique is still useful and necessary but I would rephrase that do you think that okay you have this uh, huge audience in, uh, in uh, uh, online and uh, and also in the magazine, do you st still think that the print press for architecture is still viable and needed? That's a very difficult question. Um, I, I like to believe it is. I think it's increasingly difficult to make the economic argument that it stacks up. But, but I personally still enjoy, you know, the kind of physical sensation of, of having a magazine and having time occasionally to, to read those longer articles, but I do agree there seems to be a lack of, of kind of debate happening in those pages from, from what I can tell personally. But I'd, I'd be interested to hear your opinion actually as a, a, a magazine editor yourself. Do, do you feel... No, I, I, still, I still believe in that. I think it's two different audiences actually, the one for the print and the one offline. And uh, what the print gives you, it's this pleasure that you talked about, but also a structure that you never have online. Yeah, and, uh, uh, but I believe that uh, magazines should become more like bookazines, should become a little bit more like books, if they want to stand a chance and really go into the depth of things. Because the the actuality, the the what happens now, is not really relevant for an architecture magazine anymore. I mean, something which has like a lifespan of a couple of weeks, it's much better online. Yeah, but it's a yeah. question. I I still wonder in Corona times if uh, if it's not going to get back. I noticed that print, books in print, and art books especially have done a huge comeback in the last five, six years, even in markets like the United States, mm. uh, more than ebooks. I wonder how this will work with, uh, with, the new, uh, with the new happening, but okay, I'm... Yeah, I mean, if we're all going to have more time at home suddenly, in, in the way that I'm finally getting time to plow through these enormous monographs, which yeah. I get sent by publishers, <laughs> which usually <laughs> just end up in a pile on my desk, you know, I think you're right, from now on there could be a more of a place for long form writing. There is one question uh, very directly to you. Uh, Oliver, you are also a great architectural photographer. To what degree do you find the architectural critique a slave to a spectacular image? <laughs> brackets, but uh, anyway. A very good question. Well, firstly, thank you. And I'm uh, very embarrassed by that because I don't think of myself as a photographer, but I do take pictures wherever I go because I think often um, architects are unwilling to provide the angle that you require to illustrate the point that you're making. So often, you know, magazines and newspapers rely on a set of official pictures that the PR company provides, but they don't show you, you know, the effect that this building has on its neighbour, how it meets the street, the fact that it has, you know, entrances to bin stores opposite a primary school, all of yeah. the kind of things that, that you want to talk about, which it's impossible to illustrate unless you take your own photographs. Yeah. So the Guardian does occasionally publish my pictures just because um, the architect or the official, you know, PR agency won't provide the images that we need. So I, I try to take as many as I can. Uh, whenever I visit, you know very well that sometimes they try to control what images are going to be published, and 
then it becomes <laughs> very difficult actually to be yeah i mean i'm very lucky because given the guardian is such a huge organization you know we don't accept any of those restrictions but i do i understand that architecture magazines are sometimes put in a very difficult position where you know you have to play the game or else you don't get it yeah but then yeah, actually this connects me to a question that was uh, somehow implicit uh, in our discussion before the the public's question uh, do you always visit? Uh, people ask, visit the building when, when you do a review? And uh, how it will change in future with the limitations on travel? That is a really good question. Yeah, we, I have a principle that if I'm reviewing a building, I have to see it in the flesh. I, I won't review something based on photographs. And obviously now that's incredibly yeah. difficult. I was wondering if maybe I should start reviewing the miniature buildings that I've got here on my mantelpiece, because that's, that's the closest I'm going to get to architecture for a while. Um, so I've, I've been writing much more, I suppose, about kind of bigger issues. And like I was saying before, you know, things like book reviews and uh, virtual exhibitions. At the moment, it's very difficult to, uh, to go out and review a building. I, I have several questions, of course, which relate to social media. So I'm going to group them a little bit. Uh, what do you think about social media in general and about uh, Instagram? Is it really only a foe and uh, creating Instagram architecture and killing the profession? Or do you think it could be somehow uh, uh, adjusted or uh, perverted to use uh, better needs and a better purpose? Yeah, no, it's a really interesting phenomenon, the impact that Instagram is having. I, I would say it's having more of an impact on interior design and the nature of public art. I don't think architecture in the kind of conventional sense with a capital A is changing that much, but I know that architects are now being asked to include uh, Instagrammable moments in their schemes, mm. you know, the, the kind of whether it's the selfie wall or the focal yeah. point of the public space where you can stand and, and be the center of the, the image. So it's, it is kind of shaping architecture in that sense. But I would say that's nothing new. You know, photography has had the same effect. And people said, you know, when cameras became popular, there was very similar debates of like, oh, the rise of photography is going to change architecture as we know it. So I think, you know, visualization and depiction have always had an impact on the built environment. And I don't really see it as anything to be afraid of. I, I think it's a fascinating phenomenon, but I don't think it's changing architecture to such an extent that we need to, to suddenly abandon Instagram and- uh, Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 when you think in historical terms, I mean, in the 16th and 17th century, uh, there was enough to have a couple of albums coming from Europe to England to launch a completely new style in exactly. a very pure way. And those were drawings. I mean, people had even seen the, the buildings before some of them. So I think yeah. it's, uh, no, it's... But it's uh, in my experience, way. it's, it's well, not thing... about the type of social media, you know. it's uh, uh, Facebook, for instance, is more controversial. There's a lot more hate speech on Facebook, but on the other hand, you can have criticism there. I've noticed then on Instagram, any post that is not about a nice, beautiful, shiny, fluffy thing doesn't, uh, doesn't work well. So Instagram is really for beauty and it has to be beautiful in order to have success there. Actually, if you want to, to for, for criticism and for uh, being uh, a little bit uh, more aggressive. Uh, Facebook and Twitter tend to be a little bit uh, better. So it has its uh, upsides and it does have its, uh, its downsides. Yeah, I was asked, I uh, somebody I, I asked find me Twitter, about- Yeah. I find Twitter useful for, for kind of sources and, and maybe spotting things that I wouldn't have otherwise come across because it, it leads you in directions that, you know, out of your usual news bubble. Um, so, so I find it useful in that sense, but I don't find it a useful format to actually engage and have debates, you know, because you're limited mm. to such a short, short space. And same with Facebook. I spend very little time on, on kind of architecture Facebook because I don't find those kinds of discussions useful. Um, so, yeah, Twitter is useful as a source. No, but Facebook is a good as a promoting tool and then for it creates discussions, but it also makes uh, things more visible a little bit. Yeah, no, I think The Guardian drives a lot of its traffic through Facebook. So it's... It's obviously effective for, for that reason, yeah. But it's a, it's a, it's a long discussion. Uh, somebody asked me about specifically about Romanian, uh, about Romanian uh, architecture. Well, I wouldn't uh, like to dwell on that too much and where it is going. But I think that uh, uh, what I would answer those people is I think uh, uh, equal for and uh, uh, good for everything is that as long as you don't have good public architecture can't have really good architecture in a country. I think you can, cannot build up 
a real architectural culture only with villas and the clubs and uh, things like that. So everybody needs quality public architecture to lead. And I think we get, no, Oliver, I think we get less and less public architecture, actually, because the state and the administration and the cities withdraw from, from constructing. So I think this is, uh, this is really a big, uh, a big issue. And then, of course, there would be competitions. I think you had your criticism against uh, awards or at least against some awards. How, how are you about competitions? Very Great similar competition. in, in the sense that so often they're, they're poorly run. So I, I would say a well-run and well-managed competition where the architects are paid a proper fee for the amount of work they do. You know, there's no reason not to do that. And I'm a big advocate for kind of well-managed competitive processes. Um, I think the worst kind is the kind of open call, absolutely no fee. Uh, then we select a few that we like, ask them to do a huge amount of work for, for a tiny fee, and then we'll pick the winner. You know, that to me doesn't lead to the best kind of results. It's interesting exploitation. To kind of online gallery in the way that the Helsinki Guggenheim did. You know, you have a kind of cross section of, of all of the world's architects desperately trying to be seen. So it's kind of fascinating from that point of view, but it doesn't create good buildings. But I mean, especially countries where it's, it tends to change because of uh, our whole society changes. But I think of countries like uh, uh, Switzerland or Germany, where even for extending a school in the countryside, you usually get the competition. So it's embedded. It used to be like that in France also, and it's kind of changing now with this ultra-liberal development. But I think this kind of small competitions uh, giving uh, chances to young architects and uh, letting even the mayor of a very small village uh, able to understand that maybe a competition is a good thing, no? Yeah, and in, in Flanders, you know, in, in Belgium, the, uh, the kind of open opera, oh, sorry, open opera system is something that we look to, you know, very enviously here because our public procurement system is a disaster. And, and there, you know, they have kind of pre-qualified set of architects on a panel and a Baumeister, you know, kind of professional yeah. architect who, who's there to advise. And yeah, I think mainland Europe is, uh, is way ahead of the UK in terms of... Uh, of kind of public procurement, mainland, Western and Northern Europe, and also Spain and Portugal, but uh, but yeah. a little bit. Uh, okay, I will start to. Uh, I think we have to start to wrap up. Uh, there's somebody who asked uh, us about uh, density. How can we promote the idea that density is the answer, and that the pandemic is also caused by our too big ecological uh, footprint? So how can we advocate things like density, and I would say also public transportation? And all those things we love so much when people are going to get now into real survival mode and uh, be in the car because you're afraid of getting infected and fighting for even very bad jobs for the environment because you have to fight for jobs in order not to have. Yeah, I mean, there's a danger that, that kind of boosters of car-based urbanism and, and boosters of sprawl will say, you know, look, we told you so, the cities are incubators of disease and we were right yeah. all along. But, but if you look at the facts, it's just simply not true. You know, some of the densest cities in the world have had some of the fewest cases. Hong uh, Kong, for instance. And yeah, exactly. Hong Kong, Singapore. There was a survey of American cities showing that actually some of the least densely occupied cities have the highest number of cases. So, I mean, the science shows that it's not true and density is, is good for cities, as we all know, and I'm sure the coronavirus won't, won't change that in the long term. Okay, so maybe we, we have to hope for the good changes of the coronavirus and uh, having chart well, drawings. No, I think we have to fight for them. I, I, I think it's, to fight it's not good them. enough to, to just say, you know, let's hope that the coronavirus changes things for the better. Now is the time for communities to mobilize and for critics to be vocal about the kind of changes that, that the world needs to see. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, but we do, we have a lot of work to do ahead of us. Yeah, let's maybe not do the big utopias architects like to do whenever a crisis comes but just to push the good, the sensible good things uh, yeah, yeah. even further. <laughs> okay, Oliver, it's been very nice talking to you. You too. Thanks for all Thank the questions. Thank you very much. And, uh, I invite everybody to, to, to uh, Miriam will also say it, I guess, but I invite everybody to follow the next discussions. I think a lot of the teams that we had here are going to be taking over. I'm very, very excited to, to follow what comes next. Thank you very much, Oliver. Keep Thank safe. you, Stefan. Thank you very much, Oliver and Stefan. It has been an inspiring talk that confirms this red thread I found in the past days, listening and recording the speakers' presentations from film directors to podcasts or testimonials. 
the conscience and the will to give matters of architecture an approachable and accessible voice pass through the acceptance that it's impossible to return all the complexity of architecture in a single article, review, video, radio interview, or in a single photo shoot. For this reason, I invite you to follow all the live conversation and debates. Each point of view is a valuable contribution to better understand how the bridge, the, how to bridge the huge gap between people love architecture <laughs> and people don't consume architecture information in generalistic media. Uh, our next appointment is tomorrow at 5 p.m. to listen and participate in the television thematic channels and online video platforms roundtable with Marco Brizzi, the architectural prayer video platform, Carolina Rosic from TV3, Adam Goss and Red Mike, directors from Spirit of Space, and, Yuri, and Nuria Moliner, Spain Radio Television La Dos, she runs the Scala Humana program dedicated to live architecture. So starting from tomorrow morning, you will find the speakers' presentations online in the Miss Van der Rohe YouTube channel. And in order to know more about them and their point of view, so you, you can send us your question for, for them even during the day through any of the Miss Van der Rohe social media channels. Thank you very much again and see you tomorrow.